Right, okay, well, yeah, we're, so we've just gone past 7 o'clock as well, so let's get started. So, um, yeah, okay, so just going to give you a little bit of a breakdown, really, as to what this webinar is about. As you can see, we've got, like, a table of contents here of different areas uh, that we're going to discuss. And obviously, say, so feel free to kind of jump in with any questions that you've got. If I go through anything a little bit too quick, feel free to jump in a question if you, if you want me to slow down a little bit or re-explain anything. But you can always watch this webinar back and obviously kind of just digest the information yourselves. Um, so yeah, we're going to be having a look at the differences, if there is any, of monochrome, black and white, just kind of get those explanations out of the way. And then we'll be looking at, you know, the best subjects to shoot, the best type of light, the best angles, when and when not to use colour, camera settings, and any other accessories that can help with that. I'm also going to give you a little bit of a demonstration um, towards the end about how you can improve your black and white photography when it comes to editing and what to avoid doing more specifically as well because these are just traits that I see across photography in general the way that people treat black and white images and, and how they edit black and white images there's there's kind of maybe there's many different ways they're supposed to do it but there's two most glaringly obviously different ways of doing it one which I will say is the right way and one which um, is probably not the best practice but I'll go through those a little bit later anyway um, right, so, oh, apparently it is actually pouring with rain here, um, or oh, pouring with rain uh, in Portugal, I think Anna's in as well, so I kind of feel a slight bit better that <laughs> not everybody's kind of always getting the sunshine. It's got to rain sometime on somebody else, I'm afraid. <laughs> Never mind, Anne. Right, okay, so let's kind of jump right into this. So monochrome, black and white, what is the difference? This is, it's a kind of conversation that, that raises its head every now and again, but simply put, monochrome means one colour. Black and white uh, technically involves only one colour because black is, well, true black is not an actual colour. It's just really the absence of colour through light. So, oh, I've got my dog to come and <laughs> disturb me here. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Fortunately, he's not very much of a barky dog when he's in the house. <laughs> very, very impromptu. Um, so, yeah, effectively, so given the fact that black and white you know white is a color and black is not then yeah you could say monochrome black and white it's the same type of terminology you know it's widely accepted term that photographers think of black and white when photography uh, when monochrome is mentioned just close that door so he doesn't come back but monochrome is not just about black and white it can also include sepia uh, and cyanotypes as well. There's a couple of examples on screen here. But if effectively, if an image has only got one hue, one color, then it is classed as monochrome. You are obviously allowed to have tints and shades. This is where grays, your grayscale comes in when we're talking about black and white. Um, but really, if the image just has one color it's kind of managed by, then you can say it's monochrome. But Wendy, you say you can't hear anything. Is anybody else having audio issues? Let me just just treble check this before I carry on because I don't want to kind of go too far down the line and nobody can hear me. Now my levels are okay. Yeah, if you just kind of make sure your uh, whatever device you're on, the, the audio is turned up and actually when you're watching this on Facebook, there is an option down in the bottom corner um, with a little speaker symbol. If it's got an X next to it, then the audio is turned off for you. So you just need to press that and maybe turn it up. So it possibly is just that, I think, um, Wendy, but hopefully you can sort it out. But it has, I think, I've also got uh, captions. We've got automated captions now on Facebook. So even if you don't want to listen to me, <laughs> if provided I'm speaking clearly enough, you should be able to follow it on the captions as well. So what's the best subject to shoot with black and white? It's not always the case that every subject will look great in black and white. Flowers are a good example of a subject that don't look good in black and white all the time. You know, sometimes you can get away with it, but not generally. And there's kind of two reasons for this. Ultimately, some colors will not translate that well into black and white, which I'll come on to and explain in a little while. Also, subject matter is texturally soft and black and white is more suited to kind of heavier contrasting objects like you see in these examples here. So we've got the flowers on one side where, the, I mean, the lighting is fairly strong. You can see there's drop shadows, but because of the colors, the types of colors on those flowers, they've not translated that well into black and white. We've not got a sharp level of contrast. Whereas with the other image, we've got this architecture image here we've got a darker inside and a lighter skies we're looking up we've got a nice clear level of contrast so this isn't to say that you shouldn't ever 
photograph flowers in black and white. I've done it before and they can look very, very good, but it's not always the case that they would always work in black and white. So when it comes to choosing the best subject, I think there's three different things that we need to consider or three kind of questions that we need to ask ourselves to decide, is this going to make a good black and white image? Or you can hear us now, Wendy, brilliant. That glad, thank you very much. So first question, does it have clean striking lines? Now the reason for this is that due to the lack of color, black and white needs a subject to be geometrically striking within the environment. Clean lines and an obvious shape gives a good sense of structure and it doesn't need color to explain form. And we've been talking a lot about form, especially during our um, uh, abstract uh, critique recently as well. So I'm sure you'll be very familiar when we talk about form, you know, what makes a good clean line objects that have good clear form. So buildings, spiral staircases, windows, these are all kind of simple examples of clear geometrical shapes. So they don't necessarily have to be square, they can be rounded, triangles, anything with that kind of a basic solid type of shape like that. So question two is, um, are there patterns in symmetry to exploit? Now this is not the case that you'll always have to, but again, like we've been talking a lot in abstract, this does work very, very well for a sense of pattern, or obviously repetition, because again, due to the lack of color, focusing upon forms and shapes and any aesthetically pleasing types of combinations, uh, like patterns, they appeal to people. You know, simply because we've not got color, it doesn't mean we can't create interest or dynamics. And patterns are a very, very good way of doing it. As you can see um, with our second example image of the balustrades um, on, the, on the right hand side of the screen. The third question would be, is it simple to look at? Now, the reason for this is that there's lots, when you've got lots of different textures and colors and shapes in one scene, they may not all translate into black and white. So picking simplified shapes less multicolored objects and texture light subjects are a very, very good idea. So ultimately you don't want the subject that you're, you're photographing to be looking very, very busy. If it looks really crazy and really busy, chances are it may not translate that well to black and white. So if you think about other instances, uh, maybe things like street art, graffiti, very, very colorful, really chaotic, but when they can change into black and white, some of the colors within those may not translate that well into black and white. So you're generally looking for more simplified objects, something with a kind of a clear finish, as you can see from the examples here, objects that are maybe darker and they sit against a lighter backdrop or vice versa, something with a clear pattern, so hopefully as you'll go through the webinar, you'll see examples repeated over and over again that should give you an idea of images or types of objects that work really, really well in monochrome. So choosing the right light quality. This is really, really important. Um, you'll see in the demonstration a little bit later on um, how you can kind of fudge it a little bit to make black and white look good in certain types of lighting, but there, you can help yourself a lot more by choosing the right type of light or shooting within the right type of light um, firstly. So just like some colors, black and white photography doesn't always look great under every form of lighting. Choosing the right type of light quality is really important. So whether you're photographing indoors and outdoors, the same applies. So as you may know already, soft light creates a long transition between dark and light tones. So this is when it takes a long time for the shadows to be cast from a pure dark to a pure light area. And it's that long transition between the two. This is where soft light occurs. But black and white works best when the transitions are generally shorter and they look more pronounced, which is hard light. So hard light creates a shorter transition to make the changes from black and white almost instantaneous. This gives us nice clean lines, a strong sense of shape and contrast. It helps us emphasize objects. Um, it's, yeah, it helps us emphasize the object. Sorry, I'm just reading my, <laughs> reading my own notes differently there. So as we've got two examples on screen here. Basically, the, the, same, the same scene shot under two different types of lighting conditions. You've got hard light and soft light. So we can actually can see quite clearly the differences between the two. And we can see how the, 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 well, so the colors, but how the brightness is on the buildings there, how much contrast there is between the outline of the building and the sky, given that one's cloudless and one's quite cloudy. But we can also have a look at the objects in the foreground. They are treated very, very similarly in terms of editing. So I've not tried to kind of treat one 
more than another to overemphasize the point this is very very kind of close to being natural um, but you can see how the whites they pop more the black areas they're much darker therefore it's that level of contrast we've got that much more crispness whereas within soft light everything feels just a slightly different shade of gray there's no there's not many clear points of pure white and there's certainly not many of pure black it really is a 50 shades of gray type of situation <laughs> but does anybody as a question give an example um, of a hard light source so it doesn't necessarily have to be kind of natural it can be man-made um, but just so you kind of got it always thinking in your head could you give an example of a hard light source just drop it in the comments see what kind of how many we can kind of uh, conjure up There's still, I will just as a quick reminder say there is obviously about another week or so left on the abstract competition. The entries are thick and fast. I've I've lost count almost as to how many entries there are. I am not looking forward to doing the uh, the judging of this because there's been so many. Um, it's absolutely incredible. It really, really is. So there's some really, really good kind of responses there already. Yeah, it's a bright sunshine. That is probably going to be your easiest type of light source to go working with. You know, the abundance of light and it's free. You know, if you're outside all the time, especially when you're coming into the spring, into the summer months, whether you are, you're getting a lot of bright days when there's no clouds in the sky. That's when you've got that kind of unfiltered light and it's fantastic to be kind of shooting in black and white. So yeah, flash, Roz, you're also right as well. Flash, if you're not filtering it, you're not diffusing it, a burr bulb, John is totally right, a light bulb as well. These are all very, very good examples. Torches would be um, a good example of a hard light source as well. Basically, any instance where you've got a light source that's not being diffused at any point. You know, the brighter the lights, depending upon the proximity, um, can create a hard light source. So that's really kind of you're thinking about torches, flash bulbs, flash guns, the sun, all these different options, the different ways that you can use and, and shoot for uh, black and white, whether you're inside or outside. And yeah, and, um, as well, Ros, um, LED lights, um, depending upon their intensity, depending upon kind of whether they're coloured or filtered or diffused, etc., um, you could use them as well. There's, I see so many of them these days, especially on Amazon, you can get these kind of lighting kits of LED panels, not that expensive either, and they do last kind of quite a while uh, because of the LED technology. So yeah, if you're ever wanting to do some indoor projects, um, especially with black and white, those, those are fantastic little pieces of kit to get hold of. So as you can see, you've got two images on screen here. Now subjects can look a bit boring, a bit flat and less detailed under soft light. Um, but it's not to say that you can't, you should never shoot black and white in soft light. You just tend to find that hard light lends itself that little bit better. So shooting under bright lights indoors or you know on a, on a blue sky, sunny day, outside it'll deliver the level of contrast that you're required to make a high contrast uh, black and white photograph like I said it's not totally exclusive you know as with many many things in photography and best practices rules are there to be broken but this is to give you a guideline of the general rule of thumb let's say whilst most black and white images are shot with some level of hard lighting it is possible to create an interesting low contrast photograph as you can see of the feathers here on the uh, top left of the screen it takes time to choose the right subject for such an advanced type of project like that it's not easy always to shoot soft light black and white photographs but if you play around with them you know if you're choosing the right type of subjects to suit the soft light in in its first instance like feathers maybe light flowers as well um, it can actually be kind of quite pretty to use monochrome alongside that but it really is a case of trial and error as with much of photography really there's, there's there's rules and guidelines we like to follow but there's a lot of gray areas within all that so finding the correct angles and this is kind of quite an interesting thing I mean this does apply to photography in general um, but certainly when we're looking for something to be very dynamic without having color angles is uh, angles are very important so yeah, as I was saying, angles are very important within every area of uh, photography, but with black and white, we just need that little bit extra attention. So as we've mentioned already, it is shape and form that black and white works on or does most of the job to make, an, uh, to make the image look a little bit more dynamic. So photographers need to consider the position 
So I've got a couple of images on screen here, but also a couple written down at the side. Low angles. So low angles are going to make your objects, your subjects look a lot more dominating. You make them look a lot, lot larger, as we can see in this first image here. Diagonal lines, again, we're talking and we're trying to exploit those ideas of uh, interesting perspectives when using clean lines in these instances as well. So clear lines sweeping across through the image, whether it's diagonal coming from the top or from the bottom, leading lines, they can be very, very useful when it comes to black and white photography. Um, converging lines as well. Um, this can work kind of quite nicely on buildings. Um, also when you've got, you stood at like the apex of a building where two walls are coming into the side. So it can either look like the converging lines or the lines that are leading away from each other. Either way, standing at those kind of positions as you're photographing a building, I think are really, really useful and just make the subject look that little bit more dynamic. Ideally, you want to avoid standing straight onto an object and shooting it at eye level. It can make everything look very flat. Um, and shooting patterns as well uh, and symmetry. I think that image is possibly labeled wrong, the one of the girl that probably should be referencing number five as opposed to number three. Um, but looking for patterns like we talked about before and symmetry, because symmetry is ultimately a simplifying the image like it also would be in number one and number two. You could draw a line down the middle of both of those shots and you have perfect symmetry. Um, it just simplifies the shot and makes it cleaner, it makes it easier to understand. It gives ourselves a sense of harmony and a sense of balance. And this is where black and white can kind of step quite nicely in because we don't need color to emphasize a shot anymore. The composition is already doing it so we can simplify it further and just focus upon the emotion or the, the grandeur of the image by just letting the angles do their job. So we can just keep black and white in there to placate the image. So here's a little task. Um, this can obviously be done kind of as we go through the rest of the webinar because it's nice to kind of uh, see what, what you guys have been shooting. But I want you to kind of uh, dig out, hopefully it's on your phone if it's or it's on your tablet or your computer, whatever you're, uh, you're watching the webinar on. But drop your, your kind of favorite black and white photographs um, in the comments. So yeah, whether it's yours, whether it's somebody else's, I don't mind. You can credit them by all means. Um, but it's just to kind of see what, what kind of images you're inspired by, some, some of your own favorite black and white photographs as well. So drop them in as we go um, through the webinar. It'd be lovely to see and we can have a look um, at some of them as, as we go through. Um, also, John, you were saying about Ansel Adams and Yosemite's Half Dome. Yes, um, I've been talking a lot about that the other week. I think in maybe about two, three weeks time, there's a podcast coming out all about the life of Ansel Adams as well, where we talk a lot about uh, his photography, obviously, as well. So yeah, that's, that's something kind of I know quite a bit about is Half Dome. Right, okay, so yeah, feel free to kind of drop those in on the comments as we go through. So next, we're gonna have a look at when to use color and when to use black and white. Because I think this is something that I've had comments, uh, messages about, for, for months if not years from from photographers you know saying should this be color should this be black and white or I see people put post images in the gallery one in color one in black and white and they're just like I'm just not sure I'm just not sure which works and in some instances I'll kind of look at the images and go yeah you know what I'm not sure either I like a little bit of this I like a little bit of that so it's not always going to say the rules that I'm going to go into are exclusive rules generally they say the guidelines and 99% of the time they should lead you to one or the other, but there is always that little bit of gray as we talk about. So black and white photography is always seen as more emotive form of art and that it focuses upon the relationship of the objects in the scene and how they make you feel. There is no color to kind of give you any sense of feeling, you know, instead the angle as we've talked about the lighting, the subject itself, it needs to create the emotion. As we've already mentioned, certain subjects, uh, lighting conditions and angles don't always work for black and white. So it's not always the case that every picture that you take is going to work in monochrome. You'll encounter what works and what doesn't through trial and error. I think, as we said earlier, you know, there is no comprehensive list of moments of when to shoot black and white. I'm never and no one else will ever be able to provide you with a, a list to say this type of flower, this type of building, this type of car should be shot in black and white and it doesn't color. But you know, if you remember our points earlier about choosing the right type of subject, looking for clean lines, simple black grounds, um, the right type of subjects, the lighting and the angles, it ultimately will help you deduct what will work and what won't work in your own situations. But I'm gonna try and give you a little bit of guidance still, this helps a bit further. 
So if you want your audience to connect with darker moods, I would say shoot black and white. So if your image, you're trying to make it a little bit more moody, a little bit more evocative, I would say black and white is a good instance uh, to choose there. If you want your audience to think more about the photo and what it means to them in terms of the story, in terms of the deeper meaning, I would choose black and white. If you want your audience to pay special attention to the shape and the structure of the scene, of the actual object, choose black and white. Otherwise, on the opposite side, if you want your audience to feel a bit more uplifted and energized by your image, choose color. If you want your audience to be, to to be told the story of the image by the photograph, then choose color. Because that's an interesting difference between the two. As with black and white, as we maybe see these two images on screen here, the idea is that you'll engage more with a black and white image. You'll look for a purpose, you'll look for a meaning uh, amongst the photograph, amongst the group here. Whereas the girl in the red jacket down here, you'll let that photograph tell you what does that red mean? You know, why is she wearing that red jacket? Why is she looking that way? The actual image itself is telling you the story, whereas with black and white, you import the story onto the image. So if you also want your audience to highlight different areas and different objects from the scene, again, use color because you can use complementing colors effectively. You could have a red flower on one side of the screen and a green flower on the other side of the screen. They're both nice complementing colors, but they're drawing your attention to different areas potentially. Whereas with black and white, you'll pretty much be only able to draw your attention, uh, your audience's attention to one particular area. So we're going to talk about best camera settings. Um, this is a bit of a short one, because <laughs> you'll see why. <laughs> um, so it'd be interesting to know if, if actually if anybody shoots in this kind of format as well. Um, the camera settings are subjective, like pretty much with everything in photography. And it's an individual choice, depending upon the brightness, the angle and the, the source of your shot, etc. So like I said, like we said, with having a list of you know, things that work well and don't work well in black and white. There isn't a universal set of camera settings. No one else, no one's gonna be able to kind of come up with a list and say, you've got to shoot at F8 and this, that, and the other as well. It's it's rubbish. If anybody <laughs> tries to tell you that, they're liars. <laughs> um, but you know, if you do remember, obviously that smaller apertures, they help uh, create more contrast under bright lights, that can kind of help you in a lot of instances. But ultimately, as long as your image is well composed, it's well exposed and it's sharp, you shouldn't need to worry too much about the actual camera settings in terms of aperture, shutter speed, ISO, because I've seen beautiful images that are done with slow shutter speeds in black and white, high ISO, a shallow depth of field. So th there's not a particular one set of camera settings for it. As we said before, it's more so about getting your audience to connect with your subject. So it's more so important about choosing the right uh, subject choosing the right angle, the composition, and the lighting. And really those are the four kind of key elements themselves more than the camera settings. With all that said, there's probably kind of one helpful tip that we can offer in terms of shooting for black and white. Um, now I've done this previously. I, I don't always do it because I don't always necessarily go out and think I'm just gonna be shooting black and white today. But this can be kind of quite a useful little thing to do if you wanna task yourself with such a similar project. I would say is go out and shoot raw because a raw image is basically kind of unprocessed data. So regardless of what you do afterwards, you're always gonna be able to get your image up on screen on your computer in color. So I would say shoot in raw, but then if you'll, uh, depending upon what type of camera you have, but if you've got a DSLR or a mirrorless, I'm, I'm sure these will be pretty standard. You'll have to look through your menu because it may be called something different. Sometimes they're called creative styles. Sometimes they're called color effects, picture effects, the different things. Um, but effectively, it there'll be an option in there, maybe amongst some others, and one will be there for black and white. And what you'll end up having is a, like a black and white preview on your LCD screen. So everything you see on the LCD or sometimes actually through the viewfinder will look like it's black and white. But if you're shooting in the raw format, then when you get your color, you get your picture then onto your computer, you'll still see it in color. So you've still got the best of both worlds. You can keep it in color, or then you can kind of then go on to convert it into black and white. The only issue is if you shoot JPEG, then and you don't shoot raw at all then any kind of creative 
changes if you put your your kind of color filter onto black and white that will affect the jpeg and the jpeg will therefore then be in black and white and obviously you'll have a nightmare trying to put it back into color i know there's loads of ai options these days to kind of colorize images but they're not perfect yet um so yeah i would say if you you're going out with a mind to shoot some black and white images shoot raw and then use the creative style on the back of your camera because then you can literally walk around with a live viewfinder and see what your scene is going to look like so it's giving you a fantastic head start to understand you know is this going to work nicely is this going to work nicely or not as opposed to shooting all in color then converting it later on and go oh, actually maybe not yeah I'll go back to color etc so yeah it just gives you a little bit of a head start so that's one tip that I can kind of offer but I don't know if anybody else shoots in such a similar fashion so by all means let me know it'd be interesting to kind of know in the comments if anybody does Sorry, I just have to excuse myself again. The dog decided to wander in and then close the door behind him so he couldn't get back out. <laughs> right, okay, hopefully that's him done for the evening. Let's move on. So, lens filters for black and white. So, I know years ago, I don't know if anybody still does use them, and used to have kind of actual color filters. Yeah, back in the days of film photography, um, there used to be actual color filters. Uh, people like Ansel Adams, actually, John, now you bring him up, um, he would use things like this. This is this is one thing he used a lot in black and white photography. Um, they'd actually kind of put these red, orange, yellow, blue, green, there was a whole range of different colors of them, um, put them over the lens, and obviously kind of filtrated the light a little bit differently. So we can play around with that these days uh, when it kind of comes to editing and I will actually show you kind of similar ideas of that in a short while when we get to Lightroom um, but these days um, you know you can, you can still technically use those filters but there are probably more efficient ways of kind of creating more drama and more impact uh, by using other other filters more so like polarizers um, these are there directly to improve the natural contrast of white and dark tones in a photograph as you can see from the examples here you know polarizer is useful in other areas of photography so you know it's worthwhile having one if you don't have one already then certainly especially if you photograph outdoors a lot it's going to really really help with kind of adding a little bit more contrast to the skies and um, it does certainly help when you're shooting reflections if you want to kind of reduce glare reduce uh, reflections in waters as you can see here it just makes things a little bit darker when it comes to water so it can be very very nice to add that little bit of extra level of contrast because ultimately these two images that you see on screen here edited exactly the same just one has the polarizer on and one doesn't so you can see how the water is a little bit darker on the right hand side there's a little bit less of a reflection and the sky itself almost has a slight gradation to it so again no you know further editing has been done on one to the other they're very much the exact same image um, but just this is the effect of the polarizer so yeah if you've not got one already I think it's very very worthwhile having some so let me just jump back into the comments before we move forwards um, so Andrea, you, you were saying you actually use the monochrome, you prefer it, you, you always shoot in raw. So yeah, it's, I think it's a good practice to do. I know you shoot a lot in black and white. So if anybody else is going out purposely to be shooting a you know, black and white projects or whatever it may be, that's probably kind of a good process to do as we were talking about before. Um, and David, you're saying sweet wrappers. Yes, yes, you could. Yeah, if you've got like a box of like Quality Street or roses left over, you could take the uh, the film off the edge of them and kind of use them over the lenses for uh, kind of color filtering. It's kind of quite good. Uh, Kevin, um, you said I've still got my lens filters, but they're somewhat redundant, as I think you can get the same effects in post usage. You can, yeah. And we're going to have a look at that in a short while as well. Right. Okay. So we talked about, you know lighting to avoid types of subjects that maybe don't work so well and um, your instances when you do want to be having kind of more black and white than color so we're going to get to the point of actually talking about what colors to generally avoid um, this is not to say that it, it doesn't always work and you could potentially sit there and edit an image you know for days on end when I'm talking about some of these colors to avoid you can sit there and edit and edit and edit and make them look all right and black and white but this is just a time-saving exercise if you've not got a lot of time to give to editing then you really don't want to be covered spending a long time you know in the editing suite so it's better to actually kind of take this advice and think about it as you're shooting 
So we talked about earlier, as I say, that you know some colors obviously don't translate to black and white that well. Ultimately, it tends to be rich, vivid, luminous colors that create flat gray tones when they're converted into black and white. As you can see on the image here, so we've got some really saturated reds, and then the big kind of bold pink background there, when they're kind of converted to black and white, they look pretty flat, especially those red t-shirts. They've just come out to be neither one shade or the other. They are very much just a middle gray, which isn't necessarily that attractive in photography. It's certainly not that dynamic either. So five colors to avoid, I would say, generally, like I say, following along the, the lines of them being vivid and rich, but bright yellows, strong pinks, luminous greens, deep rich reds uh, and deep blues and deep purples. So it'll take more time and effort to make local adjustments uh, to objects with these colors on when it comes to editing, just to make them a little bit less flat as I was talking about before. But ultimately, if you can try and avoid these heavy uh, saturated colors, especially when you're thinking about shooting black and white, you know, if you've got such rich, vivid, bold colors, if that's visually drawing you in, then keep them as color. They are obviously probably gonna be a better, stronger format for a color image. Whereas if you're photographing an object that very much lacks a lot of color, then you may have a kind of a good subject there for black and white already. It's better to kind of work with what's actually in front of you rather than trying to overdo something that doesn't exist, if you see what I mean. So, right, okay, so we're gonna move on to our little demonstration now. So bear with me for a minute. Hopefully I'm gonna get this to work just as easily I was practicing a little bit earlier. So I'm gonna go into Lightroom. So let me just hopefully drag this across the screen. So fingers crossed, everything is just being cast from that screen now. So I'm just gonna watch for the live. Yeah, there we go, it's working so you can see it all. So yeah, basically I've got two images. I've got two versions of two images because I'm gonna show you the right way. Well, I would say the best practice and probably an, an incorrect way. I never, I never like to say anything is wrong in black and white. There's just different ways and maybe slightly more efficient and stronger ways to do things. So I've got an image that um, I'm gonna show you uh, that was shot under hard light, which is our first one on screen here. <clears throat> And then we're also going to have a look at another one in uh, soft light. And hopefully you'll be able to see the time it takes to make a good black and white image when you've got the right type of subject uh, and you've also got the right type of lighting as opposed to how much maybe more time it possibly will take me uh, when it comes to soft light. So what I'm going to do with this first image here is basically, um, now again, everything I'm going to do in, in Lightroom here should be pretty standard. Um, so even if you're not using Lightroom, if you're using uh, Photoshop, Affinity, whatever it may be, all the tools that I'm going to use, you'll be able to kind of use elsewhere as well. So there's nothing particularly special to Lightroom, I wouldn't have thought. Um, so yeah, the first practice I'm going to do is basically to show you what I think quite a few people naturally gravitate to when it comes to black and white and that is just simply to desaturate the colors so all I'm going to do here is just scroll on down where am I there we go saturation and uh, let's just go pff, minus 100% black and white and I used to do this years and years and years ago very much because a lot of the time there weren't as many tools in Lightroom and you know I didn't know everything about photography still don't um, so yeah, so it was very much just a case of, you know, a lack of education. I didn't know there's alternative options there. And I still this I still see this going on. So hopefully, you know, even if you do do this now, you know, we can try and kind of help you understand the benefits of why to maybe avoid this practice and why it doesn't always work so well. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of park that to one side. So we've got our DSAT there and we've now got a different version. Well, it's the exact same image, but we're gonna edit it differently anyway. So let's scroll up back to the top. Now, there is a direct option in Lightroom here um, that you can use just for black and white. There is also the same type of thing in Photoshop. There's the same type of thing in, um, in Affinity and Luminar as well. So as I said, these aren't kind of completely unique. But basically, we just kind of set this up here. So to begin with, it's just converted it straight to black and white. But now what it gives us the option of further down, we talked about lens filters before Kevin was saying that he's had these lens filters. And these sliders here are effectively the same type of thing. These are, feature all the different colors that you used to be able to have with lens filters for black and white photography. Um, and even though our image is still 
is, is as we see it is black and white the colors all technically exist if you imagine the black and white kind of layer is put over our picture here we can still play around with the colors that existed in in there to begin with and we can still manipulate them now not every slider will be effective because it depends on what colors existed so if i move the red it's not going to move so much because there wasn't much red in the image to begin with. So what we can play around with the colors that, that were more prominently there. So I think there were some yellows. So just by isolating these individual channels, I can create that a little bit more contrast. What I'm probably going to do is actually start off with the sky because that was the most abundant uh, kind of color there, those blues. So it was not really much of the aqua in the blues. So we're just going to lower the blues down and what it's going to do is just darken it like the, the idea of the polarizer did a little bit earlier that it just darkened the sky a little bit. So again if you don't have a polarizer this is maybe a different way of uh, being able to kind of create that effect so to speak. So just by darkening it all we're doing is just isolating the sky in those instances and we're just um, reducing the exposure that little bit more. So I'm just going to play around with a couple of the other sliders and just try and create ourselves a little bit more sense of sharpness, a little bit more contrast so we're getting the, uh, the statue to kind of pop off a little bit more against the lighter clouds. And I think we had a little bit of tones, yeah a few purpley tones and I don't think there was that much magenta in there either way. But as I said these are all little features and tools that you'd be able to find pretty much in you know in any type of editing I don't necessarily know when it comes to like mobile apps how much functionality there is there <coughs> and another thing that you probably know by now that I like to do is always add in um, vignettes not always but I think they'll get they're very very effective in black and white but I'm just going to add in some negative vignetting just to push the eye towards the middle because ultimately I'm trying to simplify the frame I'm complementing the fact that the whole image is black and white just by darkening the edges and it just pushes the eye into the middle so not much you know what's well, taking me a minute really to do that so let's compare the two all right <coughs> oh pardon me all right let's put our original image up here and so there we go these are our two examples here now this was shot under hard light just gonna have a drink for a quick second it's taken me about 60 seconds to edit the image on the right hand side and well, one second to do the one on the left but really ultimately is very very much a minimal amount of time but you can see how much difference there is between a quick desaturation and a desaturation but then with further tweaks to the colors that were originally in the image so it's very simple to do not every single slider uh, will have an effect because it depends upon the colors that were in the image the yellows oranges and blues and purples probably had the biggest effect um, on this image that we've been looking at but hopefully that gives you kind of a quite clear indication as to maybe why you should avoid just doing a straight up desaturation and there's a lot more power to play around with those individual color sliders so with whatever type of software that you're actually doing it with if you've got the ability to make these changes like these I've been doing in Lightroom um, I definitely definitely um, you know advocate doing them I think even if you're using Lightroom on a tablet they've got these options as well so it's not just a case that it's only like desktop software so hopefully that, that kind of helps a little bit more with demonstrations I don't know if anybody edits like that it'd be kind of quite interesting to know if anybody just do just a normal straight up black and white to so say it's you know it's not a bad thing I'm not trying to kind of bash anybody over the head to say you shouldn't be doing that but hopefully you can see there's benefits to treating your image a little bit differently <coughs> right so we're going to move from uh, kind of hard light I'm going to have a look at soft light for a minute. So, the same thing again. Let's just go back. Right, so we're going to basically do the same thing again. So, with this image, we're going to do a straight up desaturation. So, yeah, straight away. It's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. But don't worry. <laughs> this is a good thing. You know, we can look at these, these, these things and kind of objectively say, you know, this doesn't work well, this doesn't work well, and then, you know, how we can improve it. But what I want you to take note as we actually try and do a better edit under soft light <coughs> is how much more time it will probably take me. Now, I'm not going to try and drag this out necessarily on purpose, but I can already see there's certainly going to be more time put into this image to edit it better than there would be under the hard light one because we've got a better type of lighting to begin with much more dynamic lighting which translates much better into black and white to begin with but hopefully you'll understand and you'll see why soft light doesn't always work so well 
So we're going to do a very similar process again. So we're going to go straight back up to that black and white tab. We're going to come back down to the same sliders as we had before. And I'm going to have a play around. We'll see what sliders have the biggest effect. So we're going to push the aqua up a little bit. Push the blue down a little bit just to create a bit of contrast in that glass. Okay, I'm going to try and see what we can get in the way of affecting the sky. I don't think any colours necessarily because there's probably a lack of colour in there so we'll have to do that a bit differently. Alright, that's pretty much as much as I'm going to be able to actually get out of these black and white sliders. Which is fine. Now the other thing I want to do is affect the sky area because it's just a big ball of white and there's there's no definition in there. So um, I have now got my masking tools. I have at least updated Lightroom on this computer. So I might as well use them and see how good they are at selecting the sky area. It may take a little bit longer than normal because I'm streaming to you guys as well. So there we go. So it's selected the sky. So then all I'm going to do is then just go back to the panel where it's highlighted. So this is just all our adjustments for our masks. And let's just reduce the exposure a little bit, not too much. And keeping an eye on my histogram, not to go too, too more to the left or to the right. Add a little bit more contrast because we're trying to get that kind of that striking contrast between any light and dark area. So it was all very flat before, so I'm trying to vamp that up as best as I can without going too far. I'm not moving these sliders a dramatic amount. The more you move it to the left and the right, you can start to bring in artifacting and banding and noise issues. You know, if you're finding you're having to go to those extremes, chances are what you're doing isn't the best thing for the image uh, when it kind of comes to editing. Yeah, a little bit more in there and there. Okay, so I'm okay with the sky. I think that's probably the best I'm going to be able to get. I'm, I'm not going to be able to make miracles out of this image, but generally it is a, a demonstration that you know, some instances aren't fantastic for black and white, as we've said a couple of times over. Uh, right, so I'm going to go back and make another mask. I'm just going to use a brush because I just want to be in control of this one manually. And I'm just going to brush it over this building. I think if I selected the object, then it probably would have selected the other building in the background as well. So I'm just going to roughly draw a line down here. Someone was asking a while ago in the uh, in the Facebook group about using uh, Wacom tablets, uh, graphic tablets, um, and this is where they're really really useful as opposed to using a mouse. They're never as accurate as mouses, um, but yeah, if you're ever using graphic tablets, this is where they are fantastic for for any kind of um, local selections and things like that. Right, so now we've got that building selected there. I'm just going to increase the brightness a little bit, increase a bit of contrast maybe a slight bit on the highlights, push the shadows down, again just creating that contrast, making some parts brighter, some parts darker, therefore separating the two elements. And some there, maybe a little bit of texture, a little bit of clarity and a bit more sharpness. So I'm happy with that. And then basically I'm going to go back again, add one more mask and I'll do it on the other building just behind with this dome peak here this building itself is a little bit darker just the glass itself on the building makes it a bit darker so hopefully I should be able to get a decent level of contrast between the, the lighter building on the right and this darker domed one on the left so I'm gonna lift the exposure a tiny bit more but as I add a bit of contrast it becomes much more darker as you can see so it exploits the the darkness actually in those uh, those glass panels and a bit more there. So there we go. I've managed to, by doing one to begin with, kind of a general uh, global edit by just adjusting some of the black and white tones originally. But then because it didn't really give me much, I've had to go in a little bit further and edit individual elements and do local edits, one to the, to the sky and one then to each of the buildings. So let's actually have a look at that in comparison. Um, so let's change them. So these are the two final versions. We've got our completely desaturated version that we did at the start on the left hand side and then the one that we've done with a more precise edit on the right hand side and you see we've, we've got a better version certainly on the right hand side but it's taken me probably taking me a good four minutes or so to edit that whereas what we had earlier with the right lighting with a hard light 
60 seconds done probably you can do that a little bit quick because I was chatting through it as well but ultimately it shows that the, the right type of lighting is certainly very very important and having a good clear subject having a nice sky as well I think if we actually had a nice cloudy sky but with little bits of blue in the soft light version we're looking at here or just a clean blue sky that probably would be a little bit better this kind of flat gray sky obviously doesn't help for the lighting but just doesn't make for a pleasant sky either you could get into the realms of doing um, sky replacements I think that probably would have been fairly straightforward to do on such a shot here um, but ultimately you don't want to have to spend all that time in editing unless you, you've got the time and you look playing around with it and that's absolutely fine but really it's a case if you want to perfect your camera skills your, your photography skills in camera as much as possible then you've really got to be paying attention to light where it falls and that type of contrast whether it's hard light soft light the very very important things to be looking at so hopefully that's been quite useful if anybody wants to let me know if they <coughs> oh, pardon me if they want me to demonstrate anything again or go back over anything whilst I've got Lightroom up here then please let me know um, that'll be kind of uh, it'd be great to be able to kind of show you anything further as well but yeah as I say all of the tools that I've been using here you'll be available to use in places like Camera Raw if you use Photoshop more in Affinity it'll be in there as well Luminar without having it on my screen I'm sure it's very very similar there's just maybe some mobile apps I imagine that may be a little bit limited potentially but ultimately you know, if you shoot it right in the first place you shouldn't have you know shouldn't have to spend a long time when it kind of comes to editing um, and getting your picture right right okay so what we're gonna do just drop that down from there we finished our live demo so the last little thing I wanted to kind of leave you with is just a little bit of inspiration because if you want to check out any more uh, black and white photography obviously iPhotography has got a blog or two about it um, there is a whole module about it as well. I think it's module nine in the iPhotography course. If you want to go back and have a look over any information in there, and we've just revamped the course as well. Um, I don't know. I'm, I know many of you may have completed the course a little while ago, but certainly the opportunity is there to go back. That if you've um, started the iPhotography course previously you can always go back to it and we've added something like 20 new tutorial videos uh, into that course as well so if you'd love it to get a bit of feedback if anybody's been into the to try out um, and, and have a look at how the new content and new tutorials hopefully it's been kind of very very positive and it's a good upgrade um, but yeah but for further information uh, and inspiration on what makes a good black and white photograph I've got kind of eight photographers here. Um, Ansel Adams is someone we've already talked about, hasn't it, as well? And this is a great example, number number one image up here. This is called um, the Tetons and Grand Snake. Um, it's a beautiful image. Uh, I think it was taken in uh, Yosemite National Park in Wyoming, um, taken by Ansel Adams. And I, I, th I have a feeling it's one of those images that was actually, actually sent into space as part of the Voyager programs. Um, because it is such a good demonstration of texture in our landscape and, and what the world looks like within an image um, yeah it's it's a very very famous photograph here so obviously Ansel Adams is someone certainly worth checking out Robert Capper, Diane Arbos, uh, Julia Ann Gosperado um, oh, I'm gonna <laughs> trip myself up here on the pronunciations I was trying this earlier on uh, Noriaki Kimuru, uh, Zhu Hansu, Hengi uh, Cohen Tejoro I've completely messed that one up, I'm sorry. Uh, and Nolan Ryan Trow. Um, there is a really, really kind of striking black and white photographer. There's just a couple of examples on screen here. You can find them. I'm sure they've got their own websites and some of them more recent. I'll probably have like Instagrams, etc. Um, so yeah, if you want to have a look at some of those just for a bit of inspiration, if you do like shoot them some black and white, um, then yeah, then by all means go back and, and have a look for sure. Um, yeah, Andrea, of course you can. Yeah, yeah. We've updated courses numerous times over. Um, so certainly the iPhotography course we've up updated a, a couple of times. So yeah, if you've basically purchased a course previously, you can always go back into it and have a look back at those modules as well. Because yeah, we completely changed the learning platform that the iPhotography course is on. And I think we will do that for some other courses kind of um, in the future as well. But yeah, you can basically start from the beginning and go back through it again. We've put loads more resources into it as well. So definitely, yeah, if you've, if you've not been into the course for a while, it's so good to have a bit of a refresher. I appreciate Plus members have the skill track videos as well to always go to as well uh, but this is just more and more more resources you can have you know you, you can't ever have a lack of uh, training facilities that you can rely on and go back to when you need to um, but yeah there we go so hopefully it has been quite useful 
kind of quite insightful. Um, I know I've had many messages and uh, kind of emails over the past few months, people asking about black and white photographs and they say they're not sure about what works well between color and black and white, etc. But hopefully, by all means, let me know, you know, if that clears things up for you a little bit more, if you understand what type of subjects work well for black and white, what colors to avoid, what type of lighting to look out for. Because I said, it's not always a case that that shooting under soft light will never yield a good black and white photograph you know you can be very clever with these types of things but ultimately these things in photography are all rules of thumb they're best practices so if you want to at least follow the guidelines to begin with before you feel a bit more comfortable about kind of pushing the boundaries then hopefully this webinar has been very useful